Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a wonderful week. It seems like we were just here only a few minutes ago, doesn't it? And if you're watching DVDs back to back, I guess it was a few minutes ago, wasn't it? It wasn't long after the most incredible week the disciples had ever experienced that a question rose that struck at the very heart of Jesus' ministry and would strike, too, at the very work the disciples and would continue on doing in their lives. It had only been a week earlier that they had witnessed the very climax of the ministry of Jesus Christ. They remember very well. It was on a Tuesday. How it all began that Tuesday night while they were having dinner. On that night, Jesus said, All you shall be offended of me because of this night. And of course, Peter was the very one that spoke up that night and said, Though all men should be offended because of you, yet will I never be offended. It was also on this night that the betrayal took place. Believe it or not, from among their own ranks, Judas, that coward, how he brought them right to Jesus. And when the disciples tried to defend him, Jesus himself wouldn't even resist. And when they threatened the disciples of being arrested, they all ran for their lives. Later they would find out this rotten Judas had committed suicide on this day. Then there was the harassment there was the humiliation, of course, the torture. Some, including Peter, would witness this event from a distance. Even on that night, a damsel would come to Peter and say, You were with Jesus of Galilee. And he'd say, and he would say, I know not what you say. And again, another maid would come to him and say, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And he would, with an oath, deny and say, I do not know the man. And later, the, those that were gathered around the fires there waiting for the outcome said, surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. And he began to curse and swear and say, I know not the man. And of course, you know the story about that time. Early in the morning, the rooster crowed. Just like Jesus said that before the rooster would crow in the morning, you will deny me three times. Then came Wednesday, the brutal crucifixion, the darkness, the earthquake, his death, and finally his burial. It became a day of lost hope. The fear that I, I might be next to be arrested was in the air. The hiding, the disciples all hid themselves. The waiting, Thursday, Friday, Saturday passed. And Saturday evening when the women came running to say that he has risen from the dead and they were told that they were to be in Jerusalem to meet him later. Peter ran in and saw the tomb and the graves close. He made no comment. He may have even doubted that he had risen from the dead. And we know the story that by Sunday evening, he suddenly appeared in a locked room to his disciples. And he said, peace be unto you. Remember the story. This was the first time he would appear to all the disciples with the exception of Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. And when they later told Thomas, he said, you know, he demanded that he put his hand in his side and put his finger in the wounds before he would believe. Eight days would go by later. On a Monday, he again appeared to them and said, Peace be unto you. And again, this time Thomas was there. And of course, you remember the story how he did put his hand in his side, dropped to his knees and said, my, my Lord and my God. Some time would pass before this next occasion 
which would be the third appearance to all of his disciples. In John, the 21st chapter, we pick up the story here. It is amazing to me that on these other occasions, no conversation is recorded between Jesus and Peter. After what? After all the things that Peter had done and said, nothing is recorded between them. And so on this occasion here in John the 21st chapter, it says, After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Scholars know that they, they are referring here to the Sea of Galilee. It had several names depending on this, the, the location or where you were from. They, they called it the Sea of Chinnereth at one time at one occasion, and some of the old maps in the back of your Bible may even call it that. But here it's called the Sea of Tiberias. It is, it is the Sea of Galilee. And on this wise showed himself. And there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, who was the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, who were they? James and John, you remember. And the two of the other disciples were there so seven of them were there and it says in verse 3 Simon Peter said to them I go a fishing it's all fallen apart the revolution is over I'm going to go fishing it's amazing to me that Simon would say this that Peter would say this after having seen Jesus at least on two occasions. We know in 1 Corinthians 15 chapter that Paul said that he was seen of Simon and the eleven. Peter actually saw Jesus resurrected and yet here we see him saying the revolution is over, I'm going fishing. That's astonishing to me that he would give up so easily. Notice what it says. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. I think that was divine interference right there. I truly do. You know, Josephus says that if you see pictures of the Sea of Galilee today, you might see several fishing boats out there. Josephus recorded that you remember James and John and Peter and Andrew were all in the fishing business. Josephus records that there were, at his day, perhaps 230 fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee. So it was a tremendous fishing lake during that day. You know, that whole terrain probably looked quite a bit different back in Jesus' day and even farther back in the time of David. You remember David fought a lion and even a bear in his day. So it was... Quite a different place as time moved forward. I believe God intervened so that they would not catch any fish this night so he would be able to say a very, or, or produce a very important miracle here. And he says, down in verse 4, And when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples knew not that it was Jesus. They just saw a man walking up and down a figure, walking up and down the shoreline. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they said, No. And he said, Cast the net on the right side of the, sh of the ship, and you shall find. Who in the world does this guy think he is? Doesn't he know we're professional fishermen? They cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw the multitude of fishes. Therefore, his disciples whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and this is the way John referred to himself in Scripture. I like his humility. Jesus talked to me. No, he didn't say that. He said the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how he referred to himself. Said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and he did cast himself into the sea. So he, they were about 300 feet offshore, and he dove into the water and swam to the shore. And the other disciples came in a little ship. It was actually like a little skiff, a smaller skiff that was attached to the bigger fishing vessel. They jumped in it and began to wrestle all these fish. 
and they dragged the net with the fish. And as soon as they were come to the land, they saw the fire and the coals, and the fish led thereon and bread. And Jesus said to him, unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land. It was full of great fish, fishes, 153. Now today, you would be penalized, wrote a ticket, taken to jail, your fish confiscated if you were to catch that many fish in one one time because of all the rules and regulations uh, about fishing. And for all there was so many, that it, it, but it did not break the net. And Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples asked him, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Again, I still don't see any conversation recorded between Peter and Jesus, or perhaps even most of the disciples here. Then Jesus come and takes bread and gives it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he had risen from the dead. Verse 15. So when they had dined, and this wasn't dinner, this was actually breakfast, wasn't it? This was the first thing in the morning. Have you ever had fish for breakfast? <laughs> Some of the fishermen probably had. There's nothing better to me than cold fish on a, on, in the morning. I love that. I don't know why, but we'll cook fish sometimes, and then we'll put the leftovers in the fridge. I love to eat cold fish out of the refrigerator in the morning. I, I love it. But they had fish here baked on, these, on this fire very first thing in the morning. And it says, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? What is interesting here is that Jesus didn't call him Peter. You know, he had actually named him. You're going to be called Peter, right? Remember? Pebble. And upon this rock, Petra, Will I build my church? He said, you're no longer going to be called Simon, but Peter. But on this occasion, he refers back to his old name and calls him Simon. It's as if he's reaching back to the old man, Simon. And he said, do you love me more than these? Do you... Agape or agapeo is the term that is used here. Do you have that kind of love for me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said unto him, feed my lambs. He said unto him again the second time, Son, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said unto him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said unto him, feed my sheep. And he said unto him a third time. Now this is where it gets a little bit focused now on Peter. You know, all of Jesus' ministry, he would say, what is it that the people say of me? He would ask these great general questions to his disciples. Oh, they say that you're the Son of God, or some say you're Elijah. But here he is pointing the spotlight directly on Peter. And he's saying here for the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And even the Bible here records that Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, do you love me? This, of course, was the same Simon who had promised that he would not betray him. This is the Simon that stood up and said, I'll go and die with you. Wash, don't wash just my feet only, but my whole body. This was the Simon that said, even if the whole world denies you, I will never deny you. In the back of his mind, Peter must have been thinking, yes, I love you, but I denied you three times. And I cursed, and I used an oath. And I probably took God's name in vain when I said, I don't know the man. And here Jesus is asking him face to face, do you love me? Must have been terribly humiliating to Peter. 
with all of his other fishing buddies watching on. I think Jesus did this for two purposes here. I think he did this to remind Peter, to put Peter back on the track of the work that he had to do in his life. But also to let the other disciples know that he had forgiven him for betraying him. for Not betraying him, but for denying him. I think that there was two purposes in mind. And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. That is such a powerful passage there to me. The directness of Jesus looking intently into the eyes of Peter and asking him, do you love me? And when I read this scripture here, it is, this, is, it, it is if Jesus is asking each one of us, do you love me? Do you love me? And so I ask that question today. Do we love Jesus Christ? Do you love me, as he said to him? And how do we love Jesus Christ? Oh, a lot of people will say, love the Lord out here in the world. But what does the Bible actually say about how to love Jesus Christ? And what does it mean to love him? And who are his sheep anyway? Jesus said to feed my sheep. Who are the sheep? Well, Jesus on one occasion said, I'm not sent but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember that. He said, I, I send, and even he told his disciples, I send you as sheep among wolves. In John the 10th chapter, he said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So the sheep are the followers of Jesus Christ. That's who he's referring to. We know that. We know that the Bible refers to those that follow Jesus Christ as his sheep. He then is described as a shepherd, isn't he? And I made a list here of a few things that a shepherd would never do. And see if you agree with me. These are things that a shepherd would never do to the sheep. He would never hold back food or water. Now, you wouldn't be a very good farmer or rancher if you didn't feed your flocks, would you? No, he feeds them both physically and spiritually, doesn't he? How about a shepherd that would just let the wolves take their pick of the flock? That would be ludicrous, wouldn't it? No, most of the time the shepherd will stand between the flock and the predators, wouldn't they? How about a shepherd that shears the sheep right before winter time just so he can lie in his pockets? No, he understands their needs. He understands that they need their fleeces through the winter time, and it is a mutual relationship. How about every chance he gets to run in the middle of them and just scatter the whole flock? No, he doesn't do that either. He tries to keep them together. He tries to keep them from being nervous and upset. How about trying to keep that whole flock nervous and jumpy and upset all the time? No, he speaks calmly to them. And if anyone has ever been around animals, understand, they detect from you your voice and the way you move. So he tries to instill in them a great trust. Does he keep them all on a leash? Can you imagine a, a sheep herder out here with leash on all of the sheep that are in the, in the sheepfold? No. He gives them freedom to roam and allows them to thrive and to grow. And, and the final one here is when a storm comes, does he abandon them all? No, he usually provides shelter, uh, maybe a fire, a sheepfold. I looked at some pictures of a sheepfold. They used to build these out of rock a little rock wall, maybe three feet high, and it only had one doorway in it. And they would put all the sheep in there, and the shepherd would be there in the doorway. And it, it, when I saw those pictures, the term that Jesus used that said, I am the door to the sheep, for the sheep, made a lot of sense because the sheep could get, not get in or out unless they came through this single doorway here but he would be there to protect them and keep them in that and where they could huddle together and stay warm. So how should we care for the sheep? How should we treat followers of Jesus Christ? I'd like to begin in Matthew, the fifth chapter, 
and look at some of these scriptures today. There is a lot of hatred out there in the world today and a lot of hatred for fellow human beings. And I don't want that to bleed off onto Christians and to the church. So I would like to look at some of these today. Matthew, the fifth chapter, down in verse 23, on how we should treat fellow members of the church of God and followers of Jesus Christ. Notice what it says down in verse 23. He says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has ought against you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So sometimes this begins with reconciliation, doesn't it? Reconciliation is, is sometime the beginning. You remember over in uh, Matthew the 6th chapter 2 when they asked him about forgiveness. You know, he says down in verse 14, chapter 6 and verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespass, your heavenly Father, Father will also forgive you. So we have to forgive people of their sins, their trespasses against us. And, and as I said, remember the disciples asked him, How many times should we forgive? And he said, Seven times seven? And he goes, no, how about 70 times seven? That's how many times we're to forgive our brothers. In chapter 7, in verse 1, he tells us not to judge other people. You know, we can acknowledge that people have sin in their life, and sometimes you have to bring it to their attention, don't you? We do have a responsibility on occasion to to bring it to other people's attention that, that they have sin in their life. But he tells us, you remember he says, to be aware that you might have a beam in your own eye when you're trying to pick the moat out of a brother's eye. And he uses that analogy. But he tells us not to judge. We're not the judge. In chapter 22, he gives us two great commandments here. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, down in verse 37 22 and verse 37, Jesus put it this way. He, he gives us two great commandments which should describe our conduct. Notice what it says. Chapter 22 down in verse 37, Jesus said unto them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the fulfillment of all of what God instructs us to do is in these two very laws that we acknowledge God as our great creator God and we treat our fellow man, our, our brothers as we would treat ourselves. Jesus on another occasion in Matthew the 12th chapter said that whosoever doeth the will of the Father, the same is my mother and my brother and my sister. Remember that when he made that statement. In chapter 25, just over a page or two here in verse 32, he says, When the Son of Man shall, beginning in verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit up on the throne of glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate therein one from another as a shepherd divides a sheep from the goats. So here is the determining factor here of what is a sheep. And look what the determining factor here is. And he shall set, set his sheep on his right hand, but his goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You're going to be the recipients of the kingdom of God, and this is why. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. You gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me, and I was in prison, and you came to see me. So here... He describes the needs of these people out here. And notice what he says. Then shall the righteous answer and say, Lord, when saw we you hungry and fed and thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you? Or when, sh 
when saw we the sick are in prison and came to you? And he said, and the king answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. And of course, those that didn't do those things, he told them, depart from me, you that work iniquity. So it is a, a, a factor, a determining factor of the sheep of God or the people of God, how they treat one another. John, in John the 13th chapter, I'd like to go over there, he, he also gives a, what he calls a new commandment over in John the 13th chapter. He says down in verse 34, John the 13th chapter. Down in verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus said on, an, on one occasion, greater love is no man than he lay down his life for his friends. And that is exactly what Jesus did for us. And we must be willing, in a sense, we must be willing to lay down our lives for our brothers as well. That's pretty difficult, isn't it, to do, to even contemplate. You know, we might be willing to lay down our lives for our family members, our wife, our husband, our children, but for a brother, that's a, that's a little bit reaching, isn't it? And yet Jesus is using that example here. In John, the 14th chapter, over just across the page, down in verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. We've used that scripture on many occasions to prove what true love is for God. And uh, I believe that those commandments contain instructions on how to not only love God, but how to love our fellow man. If, as we've said for years, and Mr. Armstrong said in many of his sermons, if, if we just kept one of the commandments, can you imagine the difference? If you, in our country, if, if we kept the one commandment, say, of uh, thou shalt not steal, how our society would absolutely change course in, in the way that it conducts itself. But the whole, all of the Ten Commandments, if they were kept, can you imagine what kind of world we would live in, what kind of country we would live in? In Romans the 10th chapter, or Romans the 12th chapter, he's, he also continues here, Paul writes uh, a little bit to the, to the church or to the church members there that resided in Rome, Romans the 12th chapter and verse 9 he said let love be without dissimulation abhor that which is evil cleave to that which is good be, a kind, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another putting the other person first of course is what it means not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, and distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. Boy, those, that's a, that is a really tall order there, isn't it? Uh, across the page in chapter 13, he says, or excuse me, in chapter uh, 13, verse 8, Oh, man, oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. If you want to know what it is, what it means to fulfill the law, then loving your fellow man plays a huge role in that, in fulfilling God's laws. Uh, a couple more here I'd like to read. Galatians, the sixth chapter. It seems as though in every one of Paul's letters he made mention of this because it was so important to all of those church groups out there. Galatians, the sixth chapter, in verse 1. I'd like to look at a few of these here briefly. Galatians 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if any man be overcome in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, 
lest you also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, it's so easy when someone falls on their face to sit around and, as they say, all you know, as they say about chickens, when a chicken gets a a, a sore on them, all the other chickens will peck it to death. So it is with human beings when somebody gets down on their luck, when they get down both spiritually or physically, that others, instead of helping that one and lifting them up, they will they will tend to just peck them to death. And uh, he's telling us here that we're to try to restore that person. That is the goal. Even in the Apostle Paul, when they found that this person had, you remember in the church in Corinth, when there was a man who had married his, uh, probably was his stepmother, and they basically put him out of the church temporarily. But, but he also allowed for that man, if he repented, to, to would allow him and he instructed the church that if he did repent, that he could come back. And that was the spirit that he wanted not to just abandon that person forever, but the purpose was for him to repent. And that was the goal, to bring him to repentance. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, he says that we should treat others with the same care and the mercy with which we were treated. Ephesians 4 and verse 32. He says, be, uh, let's be, pick it up in verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But be you kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. All we have to do, brethren, is to look back over our, our past and realize what God has done for us. And so when you see one of your brothers that's down and out, that's maybe not as spiritually mature as maybe you are yourself, know that they need your Forgiveness. They need your mercy just like God gave us mercy when we cried out to him and asked for his forgiveness and his love. Colossians, the third chapter, over just the next, next couple of chapters here, Colossians 3 and verse 12. And we, we look at these Christian virtues here. Colossians 3 and verse 12, he says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forgiving one another, and forgiving, for, uh, he says, forbearing one another, I should say. My bifocal got in the way there. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. That's the glue that holds it together. Love and forgiveness is what holds the Christian life together. First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, over just a page or two, he says... Down in verse 9, when he wrote to the, the Thessalonians, he says, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And it's, it's almost as if he's saying here, do we really need to be taught brotherly love? I mean, really? Do we really need to be instructed how to have brotherly love one for another. I mean, that is the basis of our, of our doctrine, our Christianity. And indeed, you do it toward all brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And of course, he wanted encouraging them to, to really have a love and a bond and a, an affection for the brotherhood. First uh, Peter 1 just a few few more scriptures here. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22. He 
1 Peter 1 and verse 22. He says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit into or unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. I wrote in my margin, very hot, glowing, warm, a sincere love for the brethren. He says, um, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And across the page in chapter 2 and verse 17, he says, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. I like that term there, love the brotherhood. You know, we don't often think about fellow Christians as as a as a brotherhood. He uses that term here. We do call other Christians brethren, don't we? We use that term. I don't know why we don't say sisterin, but we do. We say brethren. And some people corrupt the word brethren, don't they? <laughs> I've heard that a, a time or two. But we are to act as if we are brothers one to another, aren't we? And... Uh, as if we are a part of a family. And that's the, that's the essence there, that we're part of the family. And finally, over in 1 John, the third chapter, verse 14. 1 John, we got two scriptures here in 1 John 3 and verse 14. He says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Boy, that is, that's a pretty serious accusation there, isn't it? Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive the, we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Are you willing to do that? Willing to lay down your lives for the brethren? Your life for the brethren? Well, we need to strive for that. And finally, over in chapter 5 and verse 2, the last scripture here, 1 John 5 and verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. And of course, that means all the commandments of God. We have before us, brethren, a great responsibility to love all of the brethren. And I have seen brethren, just like family members, fight. And it is one that has caused me a great deal of stress and distraught to see brothers and sisters fight within the church of God. And sometime, as the old teacher told me a long time ago, sometime you just step back and say, you go to the blue corner and you go to the red corner, and when you hear the bell, no hitting below the belt. But I'd rather see a church that thrives in this sense of brotherhood and know that we have a great destiny someday, as I've always said, are you going to stand up in the kingdom of God and say, what is he doing here? Or what's she doing here? No, we need to have this sense of brotherly love now. And I believe with all my heart that we're being tested to see what kind of metal we are now. And how we treat one another I believe is a great test that we may overlook that determines what kind of character we really have within our hearts. It falls on each of us, and we must be willing to forgive. We must be willing to overlook faults, to help others in time of need. Sometimes we need to chasten others. Sometimes we need to be chastened but to gently lift up if necessary. We must be willing to die for our brethren and consider that. 
This is a great calling, but perhaps it is one reason we have, brothers and sisters, here on this earth today to see if we really care or not. It seems to be a test of our hearts whether we truly have concern for others or are we only concerned with our own well-being. It certainly ranks high on the list with God. I can tell you this. When a mother and a father, a parent, looks down at their own children and sees them caring and loving each other instead of fighting all the time, on a rare occasion when you see your children actually loving each other, it is a great honor to see that. You know that you have accomplished a great task for your children to love one another. And I know that it is certainly a rewarding feeling in my own life. No greater honor than to see them love one another. So it is, I believe, with the children of God. And I know that when he sees us love one another, it fills him with a great deal of joy and warmth to see his love shining through his own children. May we always have a deep love for the brotherhood.